Good afternoon. I hope you're all keeping well and staying safe. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the digital group here at the IIEA. I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar today and give a very warm welcome to our distinguished guest, Dr. Petrius Gilgalvas, Gil who's head of the unit for digital innovation and blockchain in the European Commission, DG Connect. And he's also the chair of the European Commission FinTech Task Force. You're very welcome, Petrius. We're delighted to have you here today and thank you for taking the time to be with us. Petrius will speak to us on Europe's blockchain strategy building blocks for the future for around 20 minutes or so. And then I will go to the Q&A with your audience. You can send in your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. I would really appreciate if you gave your name and affiliation when you're asking a question. And then I'll come back to you after Petrus has finished his presentation for, for your questions. Today's presentation is on the record as is the Q&A. Please feel free to join uh, on our Twitter account on the handle at IIEA. The European Commission has identified blockchain as having enormous potential for the public sector, industry and society, with opportunities for startups, large corporations, administrations and citizens. The EU is supporting blockchain across policy, regulation, regulatory and funding fronts to encourage governments, universities and industry to accelerate the development of research and innovation uh, ecosystems. Another key aspect of the EU's approach is the focus on all member states on the development of digital skills and talent in the area of frontier technologies like blockchain, IoT and AI. The person who is driving and leading Europe's ambition to set the global standard for blockchain technologies is Dr. Peter Gisalvas. Petrus it will, up, will outline for us today the EU approach to blockchain, which is technology neutral, innovation first and holistic. He will explain the role of EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum, which is a European blockchain partnership for the 29 countries. He will ex also explore the apparent tension between creating a regulatory framework and an innovation system, the role of a regulatory sandbox and the importance of Europe, the European blockchain services infrastructure. And he will also discuss standards and legislative initiatives on crypto assets, smart contracts, data and self-sovereign identity. Dr. Peter or Petrus Zilgalvas is the head of the unit of digital innovation and blockchain and co-chair of the EU FinTech Task Force. He is a barrister by profession. He studied and graduated in the University of Southern California in UCLA and Harvard University. He has published widely. He is previously visiting fellow at the University of Oxford and the World Bank and has, he has been deputy head of the bioethics department of the Council of Europe and has held various positions in the Latvian civil service in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Environment. Petrus, we look forward to your presentation and over to you now. Thank you very much for this very nice introduction and for welcoming me here. Uh, the only bad thing about it is I don't have the chance to be in, in Dublin in, uh, in beautiful Ireland. So uh, very much a, a place that I, I cherish visiting and hopefully we'll be able to again uh, when we open up uh, Europe. Uh, talking a little bit about blockchain, first of all, perhaps demystifying it a little bit because not everyone in the audience might not be familiar in, in detail with uh, blockchain. It is not simply Bitcoin. Bitcoin, in a way, was the first proof of concept and very interesting for that where the white paper came out in uh, 2000 and, uh, 2009, and then uh, came online and started being uh, both mined and traded soon after that. And now is obviously a little bit on the tip of many people's tongues with the uh, rise in uh, cryptocurrencies and then recent, recent fall and uh, perhaps stabilization for the time period being. But it is much more than that. Um, blockchain, you can say, is a type of database. It differs from a typical database in the way that it stores information. 
blockchain store data in blocks that are then chained together, linked together. As new data comes in, it's entered into a fresh block. Once the block is filled with data, it's chained onto a previous block, which makes the data chained together in chronological order. Different types of information can be stored on a blockchain, but the most common use has been as a ledger for transactions. You can say a trustless ledger for transactions in the sense that you don't need a trusted third party. So some types of blockchains, which are so-called permissioned, which are run by a company, an institution, a group of companies, a group of institutions, or a group of citizens, they might only allow validators who are accepted by them. So there might be third parties, even though this is generally not centralized to one single party like a bank. Uh, decentralized blockchains are immutable, which means that the data entered is irreversible. It is uh, there permanently. Now to speak a little bit about some of the activities that we have. It was mentioned that we have a holistic, uh, you could say a blockchain strategy. And uh, this is predicated on the idea that, as I mentioned at the beginning, blockchain is not simply financial services and certainly not simply Bitcoin. It has moved on further to being a technology that is what is called Turing complete, which means that it can be programmed to, in principle, do anything. This is also a difference with Bitcoin, which basically is a transaction with Bitcoin. And that's what it can do. Um, so it was not Turing complete. The Turing complete language came with Ethereum, which was a later blockchain. And then also an important point because uh, you get in a way a misconception and in a way a truth that blockchain can be wasteful of energy use. This is true of the original blockchain model. As I say, this is going back to 2008, 2009. So relatively old for software, which was called proof of work which is basically a mathematical race, a race to solve mathematical equations by computers, which actually in the original design of Bitcoin was going to be something that people could do at home just with their PCs. But then it turned out to be these massive uh, computer farms set up to just do the mining, many of them in China. This is not at all good in terms of energy efficiency. So what has been thought up since then are a lot of different kinds of consensus mechanisms is what this mining does. It is a way of having consensus on a block saying, okay, not necessarily that the data in it is believable, garbage in, garbage out, but what was inserted was what was inserted on that date. So that's what's immutable. Um, and these new consensus mechanisms are like regular uh, ICT, like regular information technology. So not necessarily much better in terms of energy efficiency, but, but no worse. And these are called proof of stake. Or that's perhaps the most well-known one. Now talking about these political initiatives, we have the EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum, which was mentioned. It's basically a think tank uh, working for us at the European Commission with the support of the uh, European Parliament who helped finance it for us. And um, it is open to all of you if you want to know either simple introductory things about blockchain. There are videos. If you want to go in depth in reports and workshops, they are there as well. Uh, there's also an expert board um, that answers questions that come up either from the community, from the stakeholders, from us, the commission. Um, some interesting reports that you can find online, uh, blockchain and innovation, blockchain and the general data protection regulation, uh, blockchain and e-identity, and one which is coming out sometime today. Uh, they, 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 they work for us, but not directly. They're, they're an autonomous think tank. Um, but one is coming out today on uh, central bank digital currencies, and the use of distributed ledger technologies and blockchain in that context. So I think that's going to be a, a very interesting one. It was based on a workshop that we held with the European Central Bank and with uh, the Bank of Japan and the Bank of Canada. Um, there are things that I can be not so happy about about our, our present way of working, including for instance right now, not being with uh, many of you uh, together in Ireland. 
a nice thing there. It does make it easy for us, easier for us, for instance, to bring Japan, Canada, um, the European Central Bank and the European Commission together in one meeting. So that workshop is also recorded. You can find it online. We have an upcoming workshop on um, decentralized governance how to govern these uh, decentralized entities. I mean, what is the practice up until now? I've mentioned Bitcoin, I've mentioned Ethereum, there's other blockchains, other governance models. You also have examples like the next subject I'll go into, uh, the European Blockchain Partnership, which is all 27 EU member states, so obviously including uh, Ireland and Norway and Liechtenstein, that signed together at ministerial level a uh, declaration that they were interested in developing blockchain together and having a cross-border public services infrastructure of blockchain applications where uh, justified. We are have never been carried away about the hype that uh, blockchain is the solution for everything. We think it's definitely a good technology for uh, a lot of use cases, uh, not all of them. So there's a, a process of choosing those use cases and it's basically done uh, democratically, all the member states together with, uh, together with us, the European Commission. Right now we're the funder, though member states will be coming in with investments for their recovery and resilience uh, funding. Uh, the, the plan for the recovery, the 750 uh, 50 billion that right now is being planned um, by the member states together with the commission. And uh, so this uh, blockchain partnership, it has one also worked as a regulatory sandbox with us because we we're building something together in the public sector, a blockchain services infrastructure with decentralized identity uh, recognition or certification of diplomas. Uh, the recognition process is, is separate, of course, it's not done by the blockchain. Uh, and also audit document publication and reg tech regulatory reporting for value added taxes and customs excise. Um, so these use cases will be deploying this year. We've already moved into the deployment phase with an early adopters program. You can also find this uh, online. You just need to uh, put in your favorite search engine, uh, European Blockchain Services Infrastructure, European Blockchain Partnership, and then the, the official sites are uh, the ones that give, uh, give some information on where we are now. And there will also be more events coming up, hopefully physical events eventually, so we can also talk to some of the, the programmers and policymakers again, who we uh, used to meet with regularly and have been meeting with uh, virtually during this time. So that's, uh, that's quite interesting. It's been done in a regulatory sandbox context in the sense that uh, this was neither allowed or not allowed by existing legislation. Blockchain was simply uh, not foreseen in most cases. So we first tested, but then invested and built together seeing how existing legislation or areas where legislation didn't exist, we as public services in the con in, along with uh, supervisors uh, or let's say monitoring also our, our actions in some areas um, would uh, give us the uh, signal that we can do it in this way or this is a better way. So very much a live experimentation um, laboratory, you could say, but moving to deployment, not simply, not simply testing. So now as we move into what's called the Digital Europe program in our new budget, the um, European Blockchain Services Infrastructure will be receiving some 50 million plus euro and moving to really full deployment of these aforementioned use cases, as well as new ones coming up with uh, asylum procedures, with the European Social Security card and SME financing uh, utilizing blockchain. So those use cases will be developed a little bit later in a second wave. We've started already now, but they're not as advanced as those first ones are. And there will also be a formal regulatory sandbox. I said we had a kind of, in a way, informal one. It was just us, the commission and the member states working together to, to do this, including a lot of legal thinking. I'm a lawyer, I'm a barrister myself and working with other lawyers, both within uh, the commission, other institutions and in the countries to see what is the way that we could legally do this and finding uh, legal solutions to uh, challenges that we perhaps faced. And now there'll be a, a formal regulatory sandbox also for outside use cases. 
So for instance, uh, developers and uh, entrepreneurs in Ireland, working perhaps with French partners, et cetera, et cetera, want to see how this use case with those regulators and perhaps with some European level policymakers would be seen um, in terms of possibilities for experimentation, live testing. This is not in any way removing regulatory requirements, um, but uh, despite the image sometimes, I mean, we are not, I would say in most cases, an over-regulated and an everything regulated continent. In fact, I'll come up with a couple of legislative proposals that are on the way or, or have been adopted where kind of rather massive uh, gray areas uh, with the very much request of stakeholders that we do this were brought into the regulatory ambit. So there's a lot of things you can do, but often investors or regulators who may be asked, is this fine, what I'm doing, might feel some unease. Is this legal? What happens if something goes wrong? Who's responsible? Different partners. So this, this regulatory sandbox will help to find find answers utilizing the um, principle of proportionality and also, I mean, what is existing in some of the countries, uh, experimentation clauses and here and there generally as the European Commission uh, with some exceptions like competition. I mean, we're not a regulator um, who is who is monitoring uh, implementation of the law ourselves. So there's less opportunities for us to say, well, you know, you can do this in an official way, but where useful, um, the perspective of the, of the European Commission will be involved there as well. So in addition to this, we also have initiatives coming up on our on underway on standardization. We're active in ISO Technical Committee uh, 307, for instance, which is the global level on um, blockchain standardization to ensure that we don't have some separate uh, blockchain in, in Europe that doesn't communicate then with our uh, partners and friends in the US and Canada and Australia and Japan and Korea and, and other places. And at the same time, ideally reflects European Union values and democratic, uh, democratic structures. I mean, uh, there are probably some of the the less uh, democratic countries uh, globally that have different ideas also about uh, sometimes the future development of the internet and uh, rights of the citizen in terms of privacy. So it's not all simple collaboration, but sometimes uh, very much uh, actively defending, defending our interests and uh, a fundamental rights approach to the uh, citizens engagement with the technology. Uh, we also work in this uh, context with the International Association of Trusted Blockchain Applications, which is a stakeholders organization, uh, companies and foundations and so on. The commission isn't a member, but we're in the governmental advisory board with most of the European countries, um, also Canada, um, the, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the World Trade Organization. So we participate there right now. We're the co-chairs of, of that. So that's something if you're in a company or another type of stakeholder, you might want to join this organization. That's a place where there's a lot of discussion about informal standards, standardization, um, what the companies think about upcoming legislation in the US or um, the EU, I should say, also the US, but the, the US government, the Federal Reserve is actually in the governmental advisory board. So also US legislation, um, but in, in that case, uh, the kind of the central banking community and uh, in Canada, in Australia, in, in other countries that are, that are active there. So there's this regulatory dialogue that goes on in, uh, in this context. And further, we uh, are active also in the area of skills. I mentioned that we have a uh, project, or I didn't mention yet, we have a project called Chase, which is uh, intended to increase the level of blockchain skills, advanced skills, but also um, regular skills to uh, make the best of this, this technology in Europe. And there's also a skills alliance for digital skills across the board, which is something that we, uh, we support in the European Commission. Uh, moving on uh, quickly to some of the legislative instruments, uh, we had the markets in crypto assets uh, regulation 
adopted at the level of the commission. It's now under discussion in the European Parliament and the Council. In our democratic European system, it is the European Parliament and the member states who adopt the, um, the uh, legislative proposals and then they become law. It becomes a, an applied regulation. Um, it is intended to tackle fragmentation in the digital single market and to have an EU regulatory framework that will provide legal certainty, support innovation, consumer protection, market integrity, financial stability, and mitigate risks to monetary policy transmission and monetary sovereignty. Um, it addresses all crypto assets that don't qualify as financial instruments. The ones that are financial instruments, securities, are covered by MIFID, which some of you might know. The ones that aren't covered that were in this gray area are now under the markets in crypto assets. So payments tokens, the so-called stable coins, which are called asset reference tokens in the regulation, uh, utility tokens. And two important moments there, it's a passporting regulation. So once you pass through the regulatory requirements in your country of operation, you can offer the digital assets in the entire EU and the entire single market. So the, the biggest single market for this type of uh, legislation globally when it comes into force. And secondly, it's risk-based. As it's a less risky digital asset, for instance, a utility token or a payment token that doesn't have a very uh, high significance in the market, the um, requirements are, are quite low. Um, and as the risks rise, for instance, a globally significant stable coin that could affect monetary policy on a national or even global level, then there's a more stringent level of regulation and more requirements that have to be met. Uh, it's accompanied by the uh, pilot regulation, which is called a regulatory sandbox plus. And why is it called the regulatory sandbox plus? because uh, it is actually different from a regular regulatory sandbox, even lifting some requirements. So the market infrastructures on distributed ledger technologies that are going to be implemented there will not have to, if they qualify, have to have a centralized securities depository, a CSD, um, for a time period and possibly permanently if it's shown to be a uh, useful, um, a useful change to the, uh, the business model, the market infrastructures model. A very new uh, legislative uh, proposal was adopted yesterday, and this was the uh, regulation on digital identity. And uh, there is a part that I will say a few words about, which is on electronic ledgers. Um, so you have the legal effects of electronic ledgers. This is something that people in the community tend to call uh, basically self-sovereign identity, where the individual can manage him or herself uh, completely, his or her identity. Uh, obviously, this can be linked to your, your government identity, which stays with the governments. I mean, <laughs> this is a, a approach that uh, we, of course, still have and, uh, and blockchain is not changing. But this can be in addition to it. And we, of course, have many identities doing things on the Internet for e-commerce, something we may do at, at work. Um, we might be have licenses in sporting associations for tennis or golf and other things that we might want to keep their fishing licenses. So these can all be kept in your self-sovereign identity. And also there is another part on requirements for um, qualified electronic ledgers. So I think this is uh, something uh, that, that is quite interesting. It's a, it's a step forward. It's a little bit of a also disintermediation and a decentralization of the internet, which was actually its, its origin uh, going way back into the, uh, the ARPANET uh, with the first email from, uh, from UCLA actually to the Stanford Research Center and the academics and the uh, National Science Foundation that which came soon afterwards. Uh, putting us not all just at the uh, behest of, uh, of the platforms, which of course I think we'll all use to some, to some extent in, in the future, but having, having more choices for European, European citizens. 
And then another thing, and then it'll probably be my, my final point is I think I'm coming to my, my 20 minutes and I want to leave time for uh, either comments or questions. Uh, it's another thing that I miss about this uh, more, more virtual world now, <laughs> engaging with the stakeholders very, very actively. So at least uh, hopefully uh, engage with you virtually is that we have a consultation on the Data Act that was published today and there. Um, this is a data act and the amended rules on the legal protection of databases, which might sound very techy and rather specific, but this is actually managing your own data and the data of companies, startups, and so on. And the part that's particularly interesting for me, I mean, the whole thing's interesting, but uh, exactly with my work is um, uh, uh, section three on tools for data sharing, smart contracts. So these are the smart contracts and distributed ledger technologies on blockchains. If you are interested or just want to find out about it, but obviously if you're interested, if you're an entrepreneur or a public sector uh, uh, innovator who are, who are working with smart contracts, please uh, set your, uh, send us your opinion and, and answer, your, answer the questions that we ask there because this is really the way that we call better regulation of moving forward, that we don't just regulate things in the, in the commission on the basis of what, what we think, but on the basis of evidence and on the views and needs of stakeholders. So I think that's something that uh, I would very much encourage you to take a look at. And thank you very much for your attention. And then I'm obviously here to uh, answer your questions or to hear your comments as well.